Fellow believers, greetings in the holy name of Christ Jesus. I welcome you to Bill King Ministries this Sunday morning. As you know, I'm Evangelist Bill King, the senior pastor here for our ministry. And once again, it's my honor and privilege to join you as we worship and praise our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. It's my humble prayer that God blesses this message and each person attending or viewing the service at a later date and time. May the words of this message be a testament to the love every parent has for their child or children, and as, as well as a brilliant illustration of how faithful, obedient Abraham was to God, such that he almost sacrificed Isaac in his obedience to God's command. And may it strengthen all our faith in serving God, no matter where he sends us, no matter what he asks or demands of us, and no matter how deeply our doing so may dramatically impact our lives. Amen. The title of my message is the near sacrifice of Isaac, Abraham's faithful obedience to God. And our references are Genesis 17, 16 through 19, Genesis chapter 16, the book of Job, Genesis 22, 1 through 2, and we I won't quote all of these, this is just references. <clears throat> Genesis 22, 11 through 12, Matthew 10, 34 through 39, 1 John 5, 1 through 3, Psalm 128, 1, Psalm 128, 4, Exodus 32, 7 through 14, John 15, 23, Isaiah 41, 10, and Job, Job 42, 3, 23, as found in the New King James Version of the Holy Bible and listed in order of precedence in their usage in this message. If you have your Bibles along with you and wish to follow along at the appropriate time, I bless you. Now on with our message, excuse me. And you may notice that I have a bit of a tremor and a little shakiness in my voice this morning. Um, forgive me, uh, a rather serious illness has befallen me of late, about for a month now. And I've been able to conceal it very well from everyone, but I, I won't uh, be able to no more. I'm under... Uh, several doctors care and on some very extreme medications and uh, but it won't uh, preclude me from preaching God's word and teaching and uh, I just want to let you know and I, I know you can see it so just bear with me and keep me in your prayers please because uh, as you may know my wife uh, Marie is disabled and she depends upon me as her primary care provider, so please keep us in your prayers, and I thank you very much. On with our message. As a father of two grown adult children, the love in my heart for them is indescribable and indestructible, and I feel confident in saying that any loving parent feels the same of their children, just as I'm certain the Jewish patriarch Abraham felt towards his son, Isaac. As for many years, his wife, Sarah, or Sarah, as she was originally known, God changed her name to Sarah after the covenant was established. Sarah had been barren, unable to give birth many, many years. 
God, in all his glory and power, blessed Sarah with a child when she was a young 90 years of age. And you find that in Genesis 17, 16 through 19. Thank you, Stano New Stanley, for, for watching us from Nairobi, Kenya. I certainly appreciate it. And good morning, Brother Nashan Afiongo. Thank you very much for joining us. It means a whole lot to me. It really does. Now, God promised Abraham that through Sarah, Sarah would be blessed with a child and that she would be the mother of many nations. Now, a lot of people get confused on this. They think that only Abraham was blessed to be the patriarch and the father of, of, he went on to be the, Abraham was actually the father of not only Christianity, Judaism, Judaism, Ju, I can't say it, Judaism, and also uh, Islam through Ishmael, his firstborn, Ishmael, who went on to his generations to produce uh, uh, Muhammad. Uh, that's you have to. That's another. That's another message uh, sermon for later on. But uh, Abraham wasn't the only one blessed. Sarah was blessed too. His wife. She was the mother of Isaac. So God, God promised Abraham that she, Sarah, would be blessed with a child, and that she would be the mother of many nations. And his covenant with Abraham would extend to his son for generation after generation. And she bore her husband a son and they named him Isaac, meaning, you may not have ever heard this. Isaac means one who laughs or rejoices. One who laughs or rejoices. Now, as I mentioned just a minute ago, Isaac wasn't Abraham's firstborn. No. For as Sarah was and had been barren for many, many years, she, in accordance with Jewish customs, gave her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, Hagar, to Abraham so he could know her intimate, intimately had sexual relations with her, which was perfectly fine in, in their customs, in the Jewish customs, in their quest for a child. Hagar did in fact conceive, and she bore Abraham a son named Ishmael. Ishmael, that's who went on to be the father of the generations that produced Muhammad, and it birthed the religion of is Islam, Muslims, Islam. Yet afterwards, after the birth of Ishmael, Hagar grew spiteful toward Sarah, feeling as if she were above Sarah in position and value to the household of Abraham, as she and not Sarah was the mother of Abraham's only child at that time. So, at the request of Sarah, Abraham banished. Now, you may think that this was cruel, and in, and in fact it was. It was. But if you go back and read this in Genesis, you'll see that God... He protected Hagar and Ishmael. He did. He didn't just let them perish out in the desert. He ban Abraham banished both Hagar and Ishmael from his household to fend for themselves. And you find that in Genesis, Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. <laughs> As I told you, we're not going to quote everything. Uh, but I'm giving you references here. I'm teaching this morning. As Isaac grew... The love Abraham held in his heart for his son only intensified. Hi, Evangelist Minas. Hi, my dear sister. So glad to see you and that you're with us this morning. Thank you very much. So, his love for this Isaac only intensified. 
For Isaac was not only the apple of his eye, but the fruit through whom God had promised in his covenant with Abraham that his lineage lineage would go on for generation after generation, producing many kings. And we find that in Genesis 17, 16. Genesis 17, 16. Similar to the manner, now we're going to have a correlation here. Listen, similar to the manner in which God allowed his loyal servant, Job, Job, and by chance, and I want to stop right there and give a big public hello and a welcome to our newest associate pastor, Pastor Job Omingo, who just joined us yesterday, and he lives near uh, Nairobi, Kenya. He and his wife, and about, I hope I don't butcher her name, Rael, joined us. They accepted my invitation to be our newest associate pastor and his wife, and I give a big shout out to him. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Job, for accepting my offer. And I look for many fruitful, many fruitful contributions from you and, and Rael. I know you, you, I know you will do well. And I will, uh, I will, uh, support you and mentor you all I can. Thank you. But getting back to this, here's that correlation. Similar to the manner in which God allowed his loyal servant Job, and if you've never read the book of Job, or if it's been a very long time, it's a long book now. You really need to go read it. You talking about perseverance, perseverance in the face of ungodly, un, unimaginable uh, trials and tribulations. Oh my goodness. Similar to the manner in which God allowed his loyal servant Job to be tested by Satan himself so as to prove that no matter what the evil one did to Job, and he did awful things, Job's faith in him wouldn't be altered. Now that's in the Old Testament. Go read it. God chose to test Abraham's faithfulness and obedience. And it's surprising that he did this, but he will, God will do this. He will do this. And he, very, he may very well be doing this to me right now for what may what I may be suffering with is is <laughs> is no laughing matter uh God chose to test Abraham's faithfulness and obedience by commanding that Abraham offer unto him the ultimate sacrifice his precious son and rightful heir to the covenant Isaac Isaac for the Holy Bible says, and I'm going to quote Genesis 22, 1 through 2. Genesis 22, 1 through 2. Quote, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. He will test us, my brothers and sisters. And said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Don't you wish God would call out your name audibly so you could hear it, so that you could look up and respond? Here I am. Oh, how I pray that happens. He said, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, it was called the land of Moriah. And interestingly, um, I, I, I have read and studied that the land of Moriah was actually also in the, in the future, way in the future, almost where Jesus was later crucified. Take the son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you, end quote. That was Genesis 22, 1 through 2. I'd so appreciate everybody that's joined us. We're, we had seven with us at that time. Now, 
let's consider, let's, let's, let's put ourselves in Abraham's position for just a moment. God had performed a miraculous miracle in blessing him, in blessing Abraham and Sarah with a son. He had decreed that through Sarah, Abraham's lineage would go on and on forever. At one point, he took Abraham outside and he told him, he said, look up in the heavens and count the stars, if at all possible. And of course, it wasn't. Such will be the number of your generations to come. Amazing. His lineage would go on and on forever and God's covenant would be passed along through their son Isaac for generation after generation, the nation of Israel, from which many kings would spring forth. Now, such wasn't to be taken lightly, for God had chosen both he and Sarah to be the patriarch and matriarch of the soon-to-be nation of Israel, an honor among all humanity. Excuse me. So, how could Abraham possibly say to God, Listen, no, I don't care what blessings you've bestowed upon Sarah and I. I will not sacrifice what I hold most dear to my heart. You understand? If Abraham had done so, he could guarantee that he would feel God's wrath upon both himself and Sarah. And ultimately, they would be erased from the face of the earth. For, my brothers and sisters, yes, God is a loving, compassionate, and kind, caring, merciful God. But he is also vengeful and temperamental at times, wrathful, especially when those he has chosen, like the, like the future nation of Israel, <laughs> as we go on to read in the Old Testament, especially when those, those he has chosen disobey his will and commandments. He isn't one to be trifled with. No. Just ask if we could go back and ask Moses. <laughs> what did he do to Moses? After Moses had listened to him, Moses did everything that God asked him to do. He freed, he, he threw, through, through listening to Moses and he, he and Aaron, uh, they, they freed the Egyptians from over 400 years of Egyptian slavery. Okay. Led them across the parted Red Sea, brought them to the, the base of Mount Sinai. Moses went up atop Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, receiving the, the laws of Judaism and the Ten Commandments. While up there, the Jews down at the base grew, grew tired of waiting and forced uh, Aaron, who was in charge, Aaron, who was uh, later handpicked by God to be the first high priest, of the nation of Israel from the tribe of Levi and the Levites became the, uh, the, uh, the, the tribe who went on to be the, uh, uh, the tribe of wh whom the, uh, the high, the priest of the holy temple, uh, came from. They, uh, forced Aaron to create the golden calf and 3000 of them began to, uh, idolize it and worship it saying this, look, 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 Jew, uh, Israel, this is the God who led you out of Egyptian captivity. <laughs> God wanted to exterminate every one of them, start over with Moses' seed. 
Moses, being a friend of God, talked them out of it. But when Moses got back down to the to the base of the, of the of Mount Sinai, he was so enraged he threw down the Ten Commandments, and busted it in pieces, called for armed men from the tribe of Levi to go and slay all three thousand of those with God's support. And they did. They slayed 3,000 idolaters, apostates, at the base of Mount Sinai for their failure to obey God's will and commands. So, that shows you that God is not to be trifled with. And then he sent the rest of them wandering in the Judean Sinai wilderness for 40 years until everybody that had been present and witnessed the idolatry, the apostasy of the golden calf, were no more. And he'd raised up a new generation yeah, don't trifle with God. And so, to make a long, powerful story short, Abraham took Isaac to the land of Moriah as God had instructed. There he made an altar of stone. And it was their, that was their custom too. When they made an altar to sacrifice to God, they didn't hone the stones with, with chisels or uh, hammers or nothing like that. They took unhoned stones, just raw natural stones, and they, that's how they, they constructed an altar that way. That was, that was their, their ritual, their way they did it. They did it. Abraham took Isaac to the land of Moriah, as God had instructed. There he made an altar of stone. He placed the firewood he had brought along with them under the altar. He laid Isaac atop the altar, withdrew his dagger, and was in the process of carrying out God's command when the angel of the Lord appeared. And I stress the, and I'll explain that in just a minute. The angel of the Lord appeared saying, and I quote, Genesis 22, 11 through 12. Quote, but the angel of the Lord called him called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, he said it again, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad. Now that's a, that's a strange uh, term for that, that angel to use back then, the lad. Seems like he would have said, do not lay your hand on Isaac. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know. Now that's interesting that he says that. For now I, 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 remember I said the angel of the Lord. For now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me, me, me. Okay. End quote. Now here's why I've said the angel of the Lord. And now I know and from me. Here's the reason. When reading Holy Scripture, and this is a very important lesson right here. When reading Holy Scripture and it says, the angel of the Lord, the, it is in fact God himself appearing as an angel. Yes. If it reads an, A-N, an angel of the Lord, it is one of God's heavenly angels, as can be confirmed by those words. Here, I, uh, no, the angel, I know from me. Interesting point. And so God therefore provided a ram to substitute for Isaac. And the sacrifice was carried out. Abraham had successfully proven beyond a shadow of doubt that he was willing to sacrifice what he loved most in life out of his loyalty, loyalty, faithfulness, and obedience to God, regardless of how much pain and grief doing so would bring both he and Sarah. 
a testament to faithful obedience surpassed only by Job, whom I mentioned earlier. For Job lost nine children, nine children, right off the bat. His homes, his livestock, his wealth, his position in society, and even his wife and closest friends ridiculed and turned their backs on him, and he ended up being covered from head to the soles of his feet by horrific boils, which many believe was akin to leprosy. Yes. Now, and I don't often do this, let me throw in a bit of speculation, if, if you will. Just a bit of speculation. Opinion uh, is another term for that. I, like I say, I don't often do this, but it, it, once you hear what I say, it, it'll make logical sense because I am a, a devout student of <coughs> humanity. Thinking as Abraham must undoubtedly must have thought, he knew God was almighty powerful, as we all do, okay? For God had blessed Sarah, who had been barren so many years with a child far beyond her child-bearing years. She was at the tender age of 90 when she gave birth to Isaac. And Abraham himself had sired the child at the age of 100. Can you imagine that he even had the, uh, the urge to do so? 100 years old. There's men 40 years old now taking, what, Viagra. <laughs> Not Abraham. So, Abraham must have thought, if God was capable of rendering such a miracle upon them, he and Sarah, and if the angels themselves were at his beck and call, then surely if Isaac was sacrificed by first the dagger and then by fire, God could and would see fit to resurrect his body from the ashes, breathe the precious breath of life back into him, and restore him back unto him and Sarah once more. At least that's speculation on my part, as I said. For such is not contained anywhere in the pages of the Holy Bible. But it does make logical sense, doesn't it? Thank you for allowing me to speculate. The point of my message this morning. Here it is. God doesn't just expect faithful obedience from his children. He demands it. For we Christians are to place no one nor anything above him in our lives. For as Christ Jesus, the living Son of God, teaches in the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm going to quote Matthew 10, 34 through 39, Matthew 10, 34 through 39, quote, this is Jesus speaking. He's telling his disciples this. Do not think that I came. Now, now, this shocks a lot of people. They skip right over this. They don't want to hear it. But I preach the word of God just as it's written. I always do. I don't throw in my own two cents worth, but I just speculated a minute ago, and, you, and I appreciate you letting me do that. Do not think that I came to bring, bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Now he's talking about the future. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies, those of his household. Do we not see that happening now? 
Are families not disintegrating before our eyes? Those of the unbelievers, the atheists, the Hollywood stars, are their children not running amok? He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. Meaning, he who finds what he desires in this world, this earthly world. He who finds that big career. He who finds that money that he's after, that he lusts for. He who finds what he covets. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. I know many of you are impoverished in this world that are listening to the sound of my voice and viewing this. I know many of you are impoverished and you cry out. But let me tell you something. In your pitiful state, you are far better off than the billionaires of this world because they do not have the Holy Spirit inside their hearts. Trust me on that. If I could rid you of your poverty, I would do so. But they, you have something far greater than what money can buy. When you breathe your last, you shall be with God. And all the money in the world can't buy you that. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. End quote. That was Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Let's say that one time. Let's repeat this important line that's important to this message. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It can't be stated any more straightforwardly than that. Can it, my brothers and sisters? Additionally, the Holy Bible says in 1 John 5, 1 through 3, 1 John 5, 1 through 3, quote, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Did you catch that? If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you are born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him, who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his, keep his commandments. By this we know that we love the children, the children of God. We love the children of God. We are children of God and we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not a burden. End quote. 1 John 5, 1 through 3. And Psalm 128, 1. Quote. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Now fear, we have to clarify that. That's not fearing. That's not, oh my God. No. That is awe. Awe. We are in awe of him. We are inspired by him. Our eyes simply cannot believe what we see. It is so marvelous and miraculous. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. And Psalm 128, 4. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. End quote. And so, the question we must ask ourselves is, just how far will we carry out our faithful obedience to God's commands, instructions, and His will? 
Do we place Him above everything in our lives? Including our beloved families and friends? Would our faith stand the test as did Abraham's? Or are we only partially committed unto him, therefore unwilling to carry out his commands and instructions precisely? Undoubtedly, it's the most difficult question and decision one would ever be faced with. And I'll, I'll be quite honest with you. As I said in the, the beginning of this, I have two, two adult grown children and my love for them is undeniable and indestructible. It is. I would lay down my life for either of them. No question asked. So personally, I'm being personal. I'm being, I'm being open with you. As, as a devout, a devout Christian, a Christian for 53 plus years, I would find myself between a rock and a hard place If God called me to sacrifice either of my children. And I would pray that if that happened. That I could reason with God. And change his mind. In much the same manner. In which Moses. A friend of God reasoned with him atop Mount Sinai and convinced him not to wipe out the entire nation of Israel for the sinful apostasy of 3,000 ancient Israelites in their worshiping the golden calf and that's found in Exodus 32 7 through 14 now Am I asserting that I am equal to or on par with the mighty prophet Moses? So vain as to believe God would allow me to speak directly to him, to beg him to reconsider and to take me, to take me in place of one of my children? No. Such vanity in me doesn't exist. Trust me on that. I don't have a vain bone in my body. I'm not an egotistical man. If I were, I wouldn't allow any of our associate pastors to ever present a live presentation on this ministry, would I? I'd hog it all for myself. No. But when faced with such a life-altering decision, does not one have the right to discuss and try to resolve dreadful situations we are facing so there's minimal adverse effect to not only our mental and physical well-being but to that which we hold so precious and dear to our hearts. Even if the person we are reasoning with happens to be the most powerful entity in all the universe, the creator of all things in both the heavens and on the earth. For as Christ Jesus says in the gospel of John. And I quote John 15, 23. Listen to me very carefully. This is the point of what I've just said. Greater love has no one than this, 
than to lay down one's life for his friends. Such would include precious family members. So therefore, now that was Christ speaking, his son. So therefore, I assert that God would allow me or anyone else in this situation to suggest that he would take me as a substitute sacrifice in place of one of my children based on Christ Jesus' own word. For our God is a faithful and true God, always standing by his word. Amen. 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 Based on this, what I've just said in that quote from John fifteen twenty three, I humbly believe God would listen and not strike anyone down for reasoning with him as such at it as it is in his nature to love, support, and his word tells us in Isaiah forty one ten, quoting Fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes. I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Either way. Give me just a second. Either way, we see from the story of Abraham nearly sacrificing his precious son Isaac out of his faithful obedience to God and the book of Job I mentioned that God isn't above testing his children in determining their faithfulness and obedience and oftentimes in doing so, the test may prove to be more than we can bear. But as with Abraham and Job, if we hold stead, if we hold steadfast to our faith in Him and endure through to the end, we shall be better afterwards than before, blessed more abundantly, as the book of Job provides the perfect illustration. For the Holy Bible says, and I'll just quote Job forty two. 23, and I'll wrap this up. Quoting, this is, this is the end that I spoke of for Job. Now the Lord blessed the latter, latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. Can you imagine? <laughs> He had to be, he had to have a lot to just to feed that. <laughs> so as we draw to a close, and I hate to let you go. If there's anyone with us presently or viewing this service at a later date and time who is yet to turn their lives over to God, and you're ready to do so now of your own free will, very important of your own free will. Ready to let go of the ways of this world, the desire for money and material possessions, release it all and follow Jesus. Then it will be my honor and privilege to lead you to the cross. Just bow your heads and repeat this sinner's prayer with me. O oh Lord, I'm a sinner. A sinner seeking your forgiveness and vowing to sin no more. I praise your holy name before all who bear witness, unashamed and unafraid of following your Son, Christ Jesus, wherever he leads me. Forgive me of my sins and accept me into your heavenly kingdom upon my earthly demise. I pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. If you said this prayer in earnest repentance of your sins, then Christ Jesus has forgiven you and drawn you in as a child of his Father. 
and I welcome you into the family. Now, this is very important because I can't do this for you over the internet. Go forth and seek a local minister or priest for the purpose of water baptism in accordance with Jesus' instructions. And the Great Commission is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And we have arrived at the conclusion of our service this morning. And once again, I thank you for allowing me to share God's word with you. If you enjoyed this message and agree with my teachings, then I welcome you to join me and your Christian brothers and sisters each Sunday morning at 1015 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's my, my time here in the United States. I'm in the southern United States, but I'm on the eastern coast. The same time zone as New York City. That's 10.15 a.m. my time, but that will be 5.15 p.m. Kenyan and Uganda time. Right here at Bill King Ministries on Facebook.com. And please bring some friends and family members along with you so that we can share in fellowship and camaraderie as, as one in the body of Christ. For we are the church, not the buildings that people meet in and gather in to worship God and and praise and worship. We, the worst, the, the Christians, we are the church. Always remember that. <coughs> On behalf of our associate pastors, I thank you for being with us. Bless you all. Now please bow our head, bow your heads for our closing prayer. Okay? Father God in heaven. Oh, that we should all, that we should attain, retain, and strengthen our faith in you to such a degree to trust, follow, and obey your commands, even if doing so leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. For you are wiser than all of us combined, capable of seeing the future and thereby determining what is or isn't right for us as your children. Test us, O oh Lord that we may prove not only to you, but to ourselves, we truly are your faithful, loyal, and obedient servants. For this we pray unto you in the precious and holy name of Christ Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. I thank you for joining me. I look forward to being with you again in this week and to come, and next Sunday. Bless you all for joining. Bye-bye.